I'm going to go ahead and relate this game to a couple other games as we talk about it here. And as I've mentioned on the stream, of course, one of those would be Suikoden 5 and the other would be Knights of the Old Republic. And you're probably thinking, oh, so it's an amazing game with absolutely nothing wrong with it. Not quite. I'm actually going to talk about the story first because I have so little to say about the story. Um, and usually that's kind of the like thing I would save for later because usually I have plenty to say about it. But here, the story is... Hey, hey. Do, do you like killing demons? <gasps> I do like killing demons. Do, do you like killing demons? I do! And then they join hands and they frolic and have adventures and joy as they go and get... I'm barely exaggerating. There were multiple points in the story where two antagonistic forces would be like, Rawr! Wait, you like, you're here to kill demons? Maybe we should join forces. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually kind of funny, which is my overall point. The story of this game is not what I would call its strong suit. There's some interesting stuff there, don't mistake me. Some cool behind-the-scenes stuff. Dragons as deities, which just reminds me of the Rift series more than anything. I, mean, I guess Rift game, not Rift series. There's some cool stuff with regards to how the different factions all have their own backstory and you know, the, the build-up leading to the, the precarious state of affairs we're at right now. The orcs are off in the distance doing their own thing, and the dwarves are over here doing their own thing, and everyone's just kind of trying not to... just kind of hands-offing each other right now. And they all kind of hate each other, and they're all kind of evil, but not really... They've just got their own things going on. You know, one of the first things we see as the peasants is... Or, as the peasants, wow. As the humans is death to the peasants. And it's like... You get the general gist there. And then there are all, all these people who all kind of dislike each other. All become unified by their shared hatred of demons. And their shared love of demon killing. And again, I'm not really kidding about that. But the big thing is it's campy. In a good way. The story of Heroes of Might and Magic 5 and Hammers of Fate or was both campy and silly and ridiculous, and it added to the kitsch factor. It made the whole thing just kind of like, <laughs> just, oh my god, they're going, okay, sure. And that was pretty much the approach to most of those stories. Then Tribes came along. Tribes felt like it was trying to do a serious story. Here's the thing. In my opinion, it failed at it. And so all of the things before, in the previous two campaigns that were just silly and laughable, now are just kind of irritating. This is easy to understand. All you have to do is imagine someone who is trying to be funny and failing at it. Because that's the overall approach. All of the sudden, the things that would have been funny weren't, which just leaves us with the base story. Let me use a parallel, because I used this several times on stream, and Gum Gum actually gave me a specific analogy here. Imagine for a moment that you're watching Spaceballs, but it's not a parody. Instead, it's, it's intended to be taken as a serious act action of science fiction literature. And so at that point, you're staring at it like, how are they going to use a vacuum cleaner in space? Why is their plan to literally steal oxygen from another planet? That, that is... How do you can air? And all of a sudden, all the things that are jokes and silly and funny and part of the experience become aggravating. I've talked about this before. It's a, it's a fairly common human concept that applies in a lot of different ways. It's when something is fails at being X, which makes it worse by consequence. You know, it, to use the tactical example, a false flag operation would be like, oh my god, I can't believe they attacked me. But when you find out about it, your reaction is going to be worse because of the fact that it failed at it, right? I mean, I know that's a terrible analogy, but I hope you at least understand my approach. And that was my approach to tribes. That's it? And that is it. So let's talk about gameplay. Now, I mentioned Suikoden 5. Let's start with that one. One of the things I mentioned several times during the Suikoden 5 run was the unique flavor of the game. There's not many games out there that are coconut chicken. Have you ever had coconut chicken? It's a really distinct and unique flavor to it. It's got just a little bit of a bite, and there's that kind of semi-sour thing, but it's still sweet, and the chicken itself still comes through, and you can add some lemon to it if you want. It's good. Uh, lemon and uh, a little bit of pepper, and I'd probably add some oregano... 
No sauce. You don't want to add sauce to something like that. And there you go. That's Suikoden 5. It's not bad. It is very unique. And the unique thing, though, I think is important. And no way do I mean any of what I'm about to say as an insult, so don't take it that way. Because I'm the same way, too. A lot of us tend to be more positively inclined towards certain games or books or movies or shows because they're unique. Because we don't get that flavor out of anything else. We, we're, we're just, that's, that's our option. Where can I go for a grand strategy Star Wars game? Rebellion. <laughs> right, that's the option. Right, that's it. That's all I got. So I'm more positively inclined towards it because it's the only one that hits that particular flavor. You could also argue Stellaris here, but that leaves me with two games, right? And you get the idea. The This game, Heroes of Might and Magic in general, as a franchise, also hits a particular feel. Uh, like a weird combination of chess and like a, a board game, but also an RPG at the same time. And all of these things combine into this uniqueness of, of how it feels. This is tangerine chicken, maybe. I don't know. I'm, my analogy is breaking down by the second. But I do think you at least get the idea. So, walking in, I was expecting to like this game. <laughs> this is the other way this is paralleled to Suikoden 5. If you remember, I walked into Suikoden 5 thinking, Yeah, my favorite Suikoden game. And then I walked out of it going, Man, that was a lot worse than I thought. I should probably mention at this point in time, before you all kill me with sticks, this is, for all intents and purposes, my first Heroes of Might and Magic game. I have played several before. I, in fact, I played one on stream, not a full run. This was back when we were just doing brief, like, two-hour streams. But, um, brief, listen to me. We stream ten hours a day nowadays, so I can say two two-hour two streams are pretty brief. But anyways, uh, but there was also a demo disc, and I think it was HOM 2 or HOM 3, one of the two, and I'm not actually sure which, that I used to play uh, semi-regularly. And those two experiences were my only actual playtime of playing the HOM series. So this was my first time actually playing one of these games all the way through. But this is also one of those examples where something on paper, I look at that and I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. And I play it and it's like, well, it's less awesome. I do have to admit, though, an overwhelming amount of the problems I have with this game come down to for lack of a better way to call it, jank. The camera's irritating to control. The camera options are weird. The 3D isn't implemented properly to the point where you can't click through in certain cases, so it's actually an impediment to being able to see what you're doing, especially on the overworld map, but even worse in the tactical map where you literally cannot look down on certain units because the camera won't let you twist that way. In order to move the ATB bar forward, or not the, the turn order bar, you have to click it repeatedly. You can't just hold the mouse down. The... It's just a laundry list. I'm going to stop here. It's a laundry list of large, uh, of small, excuse me, it's a large laundry list of small issues that just kind of pile up to make the whole thing just... <sighs> the core issues, there's only a few of those, but, you know, the fact that the game kind of leans towards snowballing pretty hard, kind of by design, the fact that the game, well, do I want to talk about that now? Um... Looking at my notes. Yeah, let's let's talk about that now. I've, I've got... My notes are a little all over the place because we played this game across... Uh, I think it was 11 days? 10 days or 11 days, something like that. Across three weeks because of GDQ getting right in the way. So this is kind of a hard one to go through. But anyways. <clears throat> but, like, there's just, there's just hassles as you're going through. Uh, let me rewind a second. Let's talk about... Let's start with well, talking about factions. That's a good thing to talk about. Let's talk about factions. You know what? No. I've changed my mind. Let's talk about music. Is the music game in this good? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's good stuff. Did I hate the music in this game? Yeah, absolutely. It drove me batty. This is why I spend so much time and effort banging on about music direction. <sighs> There's a problem in the game. So, uh, first thing it does is anytime you switch windows, like, say, the town window to the recruitment window, back to the overworld, into combat, out of combat, enemy turn, back to overworld, back to turn, uh, back, or not to back to turn, back to the city menu, to the build menu, then back to the city menu, then back to the overworld, then back to turn, and then all of those, all of those incidents I just mentioned have a separate song that plays. So what ends up happening is you hear the first three seconds of a large number of songs just over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And it gets mind-numbing after a while. 
This is a problem for several reasons, not the least of which being we're effectively being robbed of a lot of this good music. I, I did a th test on camera. Actually, I did several tests. One was I just pulled up the soundtrack for the game as, just, as like a separate thing, completely separate from the game. And I just hit play, and then I muted the music in the game. And God, it was just, it was night and day. All of a sudden, I could just enjoy the music of the game rather than... As, as I'm just going through it, right? But the other thing, though, and this, uh, like I said, I, I feel like I was robbed of the music. But the other thing it does wrong is it does the old SNES problem. For those of you who don't remember, and I bashed several old Final Fantasy games for this exact same problem. They had a thing where, let's say you have like a one-minute song here. And so you enter the overworld, and it pl starts playing the overworld song. And then you get about 10 seconds in, and then you get a random encounter. So you go fight. Now, in more modern games, including late SNES games, it would, it would have saved your position in the song. So once you come back out of combat, it just starts replaying the game, or replaying the song, excuse me, from the same moment you were. This adds to a general degree of continuity and vibe of the music, and it also means you get to actually hear the songs, especially the longer songs, rather than them just being restarted every time you re-enter the trigger point. This game does the restart thing. Every single time you enter that town, you hear the first five seconds of the song. Not the next five seconds, the first five seconds. And I mention this point separately, because these two points are both bad things, and both of them make each other worse. You just hear the same five seconds of the, of the songs over and over and over, and it's aggravating. And again, I feel it robs us of the soundtrack, which is a good soundtrack. But... There's other things that uh, can be enjoyed about this. Like, for example, how many of you like the city screens in HOM5? I easily raise my hand on that one. So you pull up the city screen, and it does the big pan by, and it's in time to the music. And it's awesome. And this is a good time to talk about how each, uh, each faction has their own things going for them. Um, I will go ahead and give the game credit for this point. Most of the factions are relatively similar enough that you can just pick your favorite and go. We were talking about this on stream. Just about everyone on stream had their own particular favorite faction for their own particular reasons, and that's fine. I will admit, for me, well, I'll talk about more of my preferences in just a moment, but for me, my preferences were more down to specific strategies I could use with specific units, and then those would become my favorite factions as a consequence. But the overwhelming majority of the other factions were all just equal in my mind. You know, I didn't have one faction that I just hated, despite what you might think from certain Inferno enthusiasts. So each faction's got its own little flavor thing, but the biggest way to express this other than simply stats... Because, I mean, anyone can just change the stats on a unit. That's, that's bare bones. That's, that's barely an aspect of balance. It's necessary, but it's like, it's the rice to the rest of the meal, right? You need the rest of the meal on top of the rice. <sighs> yes, I know, that's not a good analogy. Bear with me. In combat. So we've got the tactical layer. Now, the tactical layer, I'll talk more about some of the issues with that later, but... The, the tactical layer combat is something... Well, I guess we could talk about it now, because I do have certain frustrations with it. Terrain barely matters. Positioning barely matters. And the controlling of it was constantly irritating, as I already mentioned. But the, the control thing I've already kind of complained about, like I said, that's just a thing. One of the problems, though, is there's no terrain significance. There's walls, there's obstacles, that's it. Nothing else matters. You're just on a square grid. This is why I refer, refer to this as a board game. You know, you've got, you've got the board out there. You've got your chess pieces, and you're playing chess. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it was something that I found a little bit discouraging. Similarly, positioning barely matters. There's no flanking. There's body blocking, and that's it. Although, I'll, co I'll cover back to that point later, um, just because that's going to be relevant for something else I'll get to in just a minute. There's still some actual tactics you can take. Uh, let me use a per direct example. At one mission, I was going up. This, I think this is in Hammer of Fate. Pretty sure, because I can picture the map in my head. And there were 10,000 brutes who were defending this one specific garrison spot. And I'm like, yeah, I could take that. And I did, it's worth noting, by virtue of very specifically walking in with a bunch of ranged and casters and holding back and, and just basically whittling them as they came to me and using specific set spells in order to haste my guys and slow their guys. Blah, 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 blah. I could actually use tactics. Tactics are present. So I don't want to sound like there aren't. 
And also I took out 10,000 brutes with an unprepared force. So that's kind of awesome too. But anyways, <clears throat> flex, flex, flex. So there are absolutely tactics present, but not what I would consider normal tactics. And I'm kind of jumping ahead of my thought here, but I suppose this is the best time to go ahead and talk about in-combat variances between the factions versus out-of-combat variants. I'm, I'm going off script here, forgive me. But in-combat variances. Now, each of them have their own things to some extent or another, but really only three jump out at me as being significant when it comes to in-combat. First, got the orcs. Excuse me, Stronghold, where they have the rage mechanic, which, you know, you attack, you gain rage, you kill, you gain rage, you get attacked, you lose rage, you, you do nothing, you lose rage, right? More rage equals more. Yeah! You want those rage, that rage to be as high as possible. There's also spells and talents and abilities for your heroes that enable you to not only get more rage, rage faster, but also uh, have a higher cap, have a higher max amount of rage that you can hold on to at a given point in time. Now, that may sound like a little thing, but that was actually, it, it encourages different play style. It encourages a bit of a, you know, you need to always be doing and attacking in order to maintain your troops. Because while your troops are death machines while they're raging, they're actually pretty weak in almost every other respect. I would actually call them one of the more interesting races with regards to in combat alongside Inferno. Please don't kill me. The, the summoning, the gate ability... That's cool. That's actually probably one of the more unique in uh, in combat abilities of the various factions. And I love the idea of, of, of the way you can use that. Because you can summon it anywhere on the map. takes a few turns. And it's it entirely dependent on the current power of the stack when they summon. Which means you can do a lot with that, too. In short, it gave you another option to body block or to... Uh, harass or to ensure that their archers couldn't attack or whatever. It gives some more tactical options into your kit alongside the dwarves who also have a really cool, excuse me, uh, fortress, I think, was the dwarves? <clears throat> Along with the dwarves who've got the runes. Now, the runes weren't great and I didn't do that much with it. I'll go ahead and be honest with it. But the runes at least did offer, again, more kit, more options in your toolkit so that you can say, okay, well, I'm going to buff this guy so that my dragon, who is a very slow unit, who has very low movement, is just going to walk across the entire map and walk right up to the enemy and smash him in the face or guaranteed hit or turn ethereal for a turn or whatever. There's some options there. The biggest downside with the runes is the fact that they cost actual resources, but by the point at which you're at where you really need those runes, you probably have the resources to burn. But of course... All of that's in combat. Well, what about the strategic layer, the out of combat stuff? Well, out of combat, we have the Academy, which is probably my favorite overall approach to things. Academy has the ability to effectively equip an equipment thing, which you craft, so you, have, you can kind of choose which bonuses it has, onto a stack. As long as that stack stays alive, they get that bonus. That's insane. It's expensive, but oh no. <laughs> you have to pay a lot of money for a Star Destroyer. Who knew? And that being said, it is my personal favorite because not only the customization it offers, but for the permanence of it. The fact that you spend more to get better units. I mean, that's the Protoss equation, right? We also have the Necromancers. Now, the necro Necromancers, they have a, kind of a weird one. And obviously, so theirs is not really strategically or so much as post-battle. Okay, so you, you killed your enemies, you have an ability to raise up some of your own units who died right back. That's an ability you get. But also you get to spend dark power to raise some of the enemy units you just killed as units. And apparently that was substantially more broken before they added the dark power limiter on that. And if I might be so bold, it feels like they did that that feels like a band-aid solution rather than you know, the kind of thing that they spent time and effort to consider because the costs for resing are weird and all over the place. And I've seen multiple times where it's like, that'll cost 2,000 dark power to raise that stack of units. And I'm just like, what? Still, it offers you a way to generate troops regardless of anything else. Now, that's important because troop generation is one of the more limiting resources in this. But wait a minute, Laura, you, you usually mention three examples when you do these. What's your third example? Well, that would be Haven, of course. Haven has what is probably the best overall out-of-combat tactical option. You're probably thinking, well, I thought you said Academy was your favorite. Academy is my favorite, but Haven is the best. Because the ability to upgrade units in, you know, and, and uh, push them up to a different tier is completely worthless, and I would barely ever use it. I shouldn't say completely worthless, but not the kind of thing I would do. No, 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 no. No, that's, that's not Haven's real power. Haven's real power is peasants. 
you probably, if you've played this game, you knew I was going to say that before I even got there. For those of you not aware, peasants generate gold. Every turn, every turn, a peasant generates a gold. And that can lead to gold income uh, substantially increasing. Why is that so relevant? Well, resource limiters. Now, this is, I believe, the first time we've had to discuss this on this channel. So forgive me for going into this topic a little bit. But most strategic games of any kind, whether at the 4X level or the turn-based tactical level or the real-time strategy level or the, or the squad-based tactical level, all the strategy games which involve resources and generating troops tend to have a resource limiter, a bottleneck. Um, there's several different ways you can call this. The bottleneck is intended to be, okay, this is roughly, like you can get a bajillion minerals, but you can only get so much Vespine gas at a time. This is a bad example because StarCraft has its own limiters that aren't related to this. But anyways, point being, those limiters limit how many of what units you can produce at a given point in time. Uh, maybe you can, Maybe a city can only produce one unit at a time civilization. Maybe you require certain strategic resources to be able to construct those units. Alpha Centauri. Maybe you can only push out so many of this exact type of unit because while it's cheap, its Vespine gas is ridiculous. StarCraft II. You get the idea. So most games, most strategic games, have this kind of resource limit or this bottleneck as a way for the developers to control your output and thus be able to have a measure of your level your relative power output at any given point in time. That enables them then to balance around the presumed output level. Make sense? Cool. So, in this case, it's money, right? Well, no, actually. Money is arguably one of the resource limiters, since money is the thing that gets you troops. But actually, that's not the real limiter, because there are multiple methods of procuring money in this game. You can go uh, running around the map collecting the, the little dungeon-crawling elements of the map, because that's kind of what it feels like. It's, it's like playing a D&D &D game where you're just heading through a cave, except the cave is the overworld. But it, it, in practice, in gameplay, that is what you're doing. You're dungeon diving. So you can get gold that way. Um, so you can get gold via some buildings. You can get gold via um, certain map triggers and stuff like that. You know, there are multiple methods. I feel like I'm missing a couple. Forgive me. There are multiple methods of getting gold. But there's only one method of getting units, and that is time. No matter what you do, just about every single source of units in the game that isn't a specific script trigger for a specific, you know, scripted mission is time limited. You get a refill of troops every week. That's it. And that's your actual resource limiter. So no matter how much you set up everything else, that's, you know, that you're, you're going to run into the wall on that particular element. You can only get so many per per. Per week. This is another reason why both peasants and necros are my favorite on the strategic layer when it comes to generating uh, resources, because peasants generate gold and necros generate units. Anyways, I've talked enough about this topic. Let's go ahead and move on to talk about metastrats. This is, I think, only the second time this has come up on my on my stream or on my show, and the last time wasn't even official run. That was like four or five. I was probably closer to six years ago at this point. It's been a while, is what I'm trying to say. Metastrats, that's not the proper term. I'm not even sure that's the correct term. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Let's say you're in an army. Let's say you're charging forth, and you're like, okay, so I'm going to send this one dude to this one spot over there, and they're going to land on that spot, and by virtue of being there, the battle is over and I win. Now, now if that actually happened, the, the enemy army wouldn't just be like, oh, okay, we lay down our arms. Sorry, I'm a little snuffly today and cold. I've, I've got, I'm fighting off a cold right now, so I do apologize. I will try not to snuffle as much as I can. It's just hard to breathe right now. Anyways, so the enemy army would look at that like, you didn't win, but I, I, I won. I got the flag. It's cool. I win. And then the enemy army crushes you, right? Because it doesn't work that way, unless you're in a game. So one of the things I've noticed over the years is that there is a marked difference between playing to win the match, playing to beat the game, and playing to win the battle. And there's a huge difference between the type of tactics and the type of mentality that goes into both. I don't even know how to describe it properly, so I hope I'm at least making some sense here. Uh, one of the most obvious ways I tend to see playing to win the map or playing to win the game, to, uh, is from speedrunners, who they look at the trigger list, because the trigger list is the win condition, and all they care about is the win condition. The status of their troops, how much they've destroyed their infrastructure, their resource chain, none of that matters. All that matters is, do they get that win trigger? And thus, they win. 
Now, my mind just doesn't work that way. And I'll freely admit that. It, it, that, it, that is not the way my brain functions. And as a consequence, I've never been all that good at multiplayer uh, strategy games for many, many years, especially back when I actually used to do that on a semi-regular basis, because I wouldn't be trying to win the match. I'd be trying to win the battle, which is a completely different mindset. Uh, this was actually called out directly in a game, I believe it was Fire Emblem Awakening. There's this archer dude whose name I can't remember. Please forgive me. And he's talking to the tactician character. And the tactician character's like, God, you keep beating me at this board game of tactics. Maybe you should be in charge of the army. And his point was, well, no, I'm trying to win the game. I'm tr truncating because, you know, it's this whole cutscene. But you know, I'm trying to win the game. But if this was a real battle, this game would have screwed me over completely because it's a pyrrhic victory. If I was running this war, we'd be screwed because I would just be trying to win the individual game, the individual map, right? Which is a different mentality. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up with regards to this game is I found myself shifting more and more towards trying to hit the win conditions than actually winning the battles. And I'm not sure I can really explain why without using the word irritation. Please don't shoot me. The enemy AI almost feels, and this is true for a lot of earlier like like early, late 90s, early aughts uh, strategy games. They all have the same general feature. The AI feels designed to be irritating, to just frustrate you. Not to win, because they're not winning. Not to, not to actually defeat you. They're just there to be like, nah, 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 nah. I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. And that feels that's what it felt like. And so the more I got into the game, the more it felt like I didn't want to win the battle. I didn't want to actually claim the resources and have the built up and have the defended homes and have the supply chains. Instead, I was just like, okay, what's the win condition? I need to get this unit to this spot. Okay, well, I'm going to send this troop up here to die, and this troop up here to die, and this troop up here to then defeat the force, and then run this one guy up there, and then the mission's over. It doesn't matter that I lost all my towns, or the fact that I have no resources incoming, and no supplies, and no nothing. I got the guy to the spot, I win. That is, of course, interesting to think about when it comes to meta strategies, actual meta strategies, which is the kind of stuff that people will come up with, usually in versus situation, competitive multiplayer, which obviously I've been hands off of for many years at this point. I, I swore off of competitive multiplayer uh, probably somewhere around, I want to say 2002, I think was the last time I really got into that. But, you know, I I have been told multiple interesting strategies. I came up with a couple myself. Uh, one strategy, I guess this isn't really a I mean, you know, a meta strategy. One strategy I came up with was when you don't have a full army, you know, when you're at the state where you have not, not yet built up, so all your slots are filled, one of the things you can do is you can use uh, irritating units like ghosts for the undead or relatively worthless and cheap units like, say, the goblins for the orcs and just have them separated into a completely separate stack of one. What's the relevance there? Well, they're body blockers at that point. Remember how I mentioned the terrain and the positioning don't really matter, except for body blocking? Well, when you could literally throw up a pseudo-wall of goblins that the enemy has to go through, you have just bought yourself another turn, or two, by virtue of their sacrifice. Little stuff like that. Um, this, of course, is a good time to talk about the campaign versus the, uh, the, the skirmish mode. One of the things that irritated me, if some of you remember, uh, I actually did a review of Age of Wonders Planetfall, and I, w I was not very positive about that game. Until I did the, the skirmish mode, until I did a random map, and all of a sudden my enjoyment just went up. And it was so hard for me to describe why. I think I finally have an answer for it. Because, and, and this is going to segue into my next point, but because mission design is important, we'll get there in a second, and because... The game's design was better suited towards this type of format. It felt like the game was designed to be do random matches rather than do missions. This is the exact same thing that I had with Age of Wonders Planetfall. Uh, to use another example, Civilization V or Six or whatever, you know, Civilization is a game that is more designed toward doing a map than doing a mission. With me? Now, I'm not saying you can't do missions, it's just because of the nature of the game, it's more inclined towards the former than the latter, and thus, by not logical discourse, the mission design requirements for that mission to be good is higher. And frankly, there were quite a few missions which were just, ugh, as I was going through the campaign. It had the Grand Theft Auto problem. In my opinion, every Grand Theft Auto game, except for five, 
has moments where it's just, ugh. And I've noticed this, and I've talked about this. Everyone I've talked to has at least one mission in just about all the GTA games where that's their, their audible reaction to, oh, I've got this mission. And what's funny is everyone's are different, but they're all there. Everyone has at least that one mission. I shouldn't say everyone. Everyone I've talked to has at least that one mission in a GTA game where they're just like, oh, I have to do that mission. And that's kind of how the missions felt like in this game. Mission design is so critical to something like this. And this is my next topic. <sighs> because skirmish mode, woo. I don't actually have much else to share about that. It was fun. It was fun for all the reasons the rest of the game were fun. I got to do a match with Hazdus. That was awesome. But he, he stomped me as Inferno. Although in my defense, I wasn't trying in uh, either with the bar uh, army to begin with or to actually defeat him. But I thought it would be cool just to give him the opportunity to kill me because everyone wants to kill the lore runner, right? That's barely a joke. Back when we used to do multiplayer Sundays, everyone would jump in to try and kill me in whatever game we were playing. It was It's just a thing. You just get used to it. Everyone wants to kill... Um, I can't think of his name. Uh, Lord... Lord British, right? In Ultima Online? Anyways. <clears throat> the mission design is critical when it comes to games like these. It, there's a lot of things that matter in strategy games. Uh, interface, HUD... Uh, unit variety and uniqueness, uh, resource and ec the general economy of how the game is structured. All of this, all of these things matter, and all these things are important to making a good strategy game. Whether it's a forex game, a grand strategy game, uh, turn-based tactical, real-time strategy, real-time squad-based, doesn't matter. And there's other genres I'm not mentioning. All of them need these things, but in a strategy game that is mission-focused, missions themselves, in my opinion, are the top thing. They need to be great. And that determines the overall enjoyment of the rest of the work. One of the reasons that I bang on so much about StarCraft II, despite its many flaws, is the fact that StarCraft II has absolutely astonishingly good mission design. And mission design is king. Which brings me to this game. How are the missions in this game? Well, I've already mentioned that there are a few GTA-style missions. But there were some really good ones, and I wanted to mention two in specific. Um... One was the Orc Pillaging Mission. The Orc Pillaging Mission was actually probably my favorite mission in the whole game. Because it turned the overall format of the game kind of on its head a little bit. One of the things I don't like about Heroes of Might and Magic 5 is that in many cases the strategy is sit and build up for several weeks. You know? Like, just sit there. Okay, you've gotten all the pieces. You've, you've locked them down. They, don't, they only have their one troop left or their one you know, city left or whatever. You've got the person body blocking there. Or you've got the garrison body blocking or whatever. They can't reclaim, but they're just sitting there on their city building up and building up and building up. So you need to sit there and build up and build up and build up until you can overwhelm their forces and just have the numbers. Because, again, with the level of... T there, is, there are tactics involved... But at a certain point, math just wins, right? You do just need numbers at a certain point. That's true in any game, not just this one. So, you just sit there and build up for a while. And that's boring. Now, better play style and better tactics and better strategy can mi mitigate that. And whether that's a good or a bad thing is up to you. But the Orc Pillaging Mission took that idea and threw it completely out the window. Because what happened in the Orc Pillaging Mission is you go around and you can interact with huts, well, farms, actually, and cities. Each farm you take out gives you money and resources. Each city you take out gives you a huge amount of money and resources. This created, this is why I related this to Doom, this created a, a gameplay loop, which basically didn't exist in any other mission in the game. Because all of a sudden, you do to get so you can make more to do so you can get and make more and do. And it created this loop and all of a sudden, I was just really enjoying myself. It was, like I said, it's the favorite mission in the whole game. Uh, in, in all three games, I should say. In all three campaigns. Um, or all three franchises, or however you want to think of it. I guess games. I'm just going to call them games. All three games, or all three expansions. Because all of a sudden, I was being rewarded for actually acting and moving rather than just sitting there and, and staring at the wall. And I had, you know, my extra person going by and, and picking up the resource nodes like usual, you know, as I have your, your pickup hero. And I had the, the delivery hero who was bringing the reinforcements that the pillaging was paying for to the main force so I could keep it going and just keep the ball rolling. That was awesome. There's another mission I wanted to mention. Uh, this is the mission with... Um, 
the so it's actually several missions but uh, there are several missions in the mage campaign in tribes specifically where you can summon troops every week it's a script actually and you can pay resources and experience to summon troops now why is that cool because one of the things that these games do is you have an experience cap per mission which makes sense warcraft 3 did that too and for basically the same reason but here once you hit the experience cap, you can then burn that experience to summon units, and then it basically it gives you a sudden motivation for gaining more experience, for fighting more battles, and for picking up the experience option in those chests rather than the gold one, because you know that is now a currency that you can convert into units. And remember, unit generation is the bottleneck. We talked about that earlier. You can also summon your city. There's some cool stuff. There's some cool missions in, in tribes. And mission design is one of the ways that this game is the most wonky for me because it's either facepalmingly irritating, really boring, kind of neat, or super cool. <laughs> and this is my final thought on the, on the game, and I hope you guys will understand when I say that this game reminds me very much of KOTOR. Now, whether you take that as a positive or not is entirely up to you. Uh, and in case you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm referring to Knights of the Old Republic 1, an old Bioware uh, RPG. I was about to say Bioware PC RPG, but it actually came out on Xbox first, but whatever. You get the point. KOTOR. Why KOTOR? I love KOTOR. I've streamed it all the way through twice, once as a lore run and once as a review. And I wouldn't mind playing it again someday. There's a lot of fun there. There's a lot of good there. And the good absolutely outshines the bad. But by God, the bad is there. There's jank, there's irritation, there's frustration, the interface is weird, the game plays odd, just getting it running on a modern system is a joke, sometimes the camera bugs out, the graphics can do strange things, and the, the camera usage is awful for some of the cutscenes. I mean, you can see the review of it for all the many complaints that I have about the, that game. And does this sound familiar? Did I still enjoy Heroes of Might and Magic 5? Absolutely. But it absolutely was one of those games where it's just like, oh, and you got to add a bunch of asterisks to it when you're going through it, right? I also compared this game to Star Trek Online uh, for basically the same reasons. So I suppose that's it for my final thoughts on this one. This is a game I enjoyed in spite of itself. It'll be interesting if we ever play any future games, especially since getting even this game running was a huge thing. Oh, by the way, I should mention this. I never got Hammers of Fate working. It, I, I, I failed. I could not get that game play, into a playable status. Not a streamable status, which is different. I couldn't get it into playable status on camera, or on, on general. No matter what I did, what we ended up having to do was we ended up having to, some fan, or fans out there, bless them, actually made uh, custom maps, uh, custom campaigns, actually of Vanilla and Hammers, and put that into Tribes. So we loaded up Tribes, which we did get working, and then we played Hammers in Tribes as a custom campaign, because that was the only way we could. <laughs> KOTOR. Like I said, right? I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts, guys. I'll see you next time.